Uh, my name is Michael Nova, and I am the Chief Medical Officer for Pathway Genomics. Uh, thank you for joining our webinar. I'm here today to talk to you about um, actionable and personalized genetic um, information and evaluation, uh, particularly around one of our most popular um, genetic tests. It's called Pathway Fit, which is used for many different uh, you know, types of clinical problems. Um, these are all, all, what I'm going to talk about is all physician ordered uh, uh, genetic testing. <clears throat> and so these are ordered by a number of different types of physicians uh, throughout the world. First, I'd like to talk a little bit about <clears throat> data uh, and, and particularly healthcare data. Um, healthcare data is a booming and, uh, and growing uh, issue. Um, if 90% of all the world's data uh, has been created in the last two years and medical information doubles every about every three years and by the year 2020 it will double every three days so the amount of information that is coming in that doctors uh, necessarily um, have to be aware of is growing at an exponential rate and it's very difficult to kind of keep track of everything <clears throat> on slide three um, I show how that uh, <clears throat> even in the PubMed literature, uh, this slide shows what happens uh, in terms of data in an internet minute or what, it, what happens in, in one minute on the internet. And there are 61, as an example, 61,000 uh, hours of music is played in, 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 or downloaded <clears throat> in an internet minute. Um, and in a, in a healthcare publication, uh, like PubMed, which everybody's probably familiar with, there's about 20 to 23 million published papers in PubMed, and there's a new and there's about two new publications in healthcare alone published every minute. So again, the amount of data uh, around healthcare and, and having relations to healthcare is is growing at a, at, a, at, a, at a huge rate. And it's our business here at Pathway Genomics to try and decipher a little bit of that information. And what's really interesting is also that <clears throat> food is information. And when you think about it, uh, what you eat um, has definite effects on some of your genetic activity. Um, it also creates data for monitoring preferences. And we can monitor, you know, what's going on uh, with telehealth and social media, your genome, your proteome, uh, transcriptome, a lot of the omics technologies, and what we do, and uh, what we, and how we measure uh, things, and what preference individuals have, and 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 how that your genes and how your and 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 your proteome and and, and the other omics. Um, affect uh, how your food is metabolized, but also the types of food um, that you you tend to consume. So big data, uh, very interested in what's going on with, with food and, and actual intelligence, and since this is kind of the uh, crux of, um, of this talk around genetics, uh, we're going to show very clearly <clears throat> that uh, your genes interact with your diet, <clears throat> and your diet interacts with your genes. <clears throat> so in slide five, <clears throat> I'm, uh, this is a little bit of an overview on the entire genomics business, which um, uh, this slide shows that uh, a century of genomics um, and uh, initially starting with the discovery by Mendel in the 1900s, the rediscovery by Mendel of how uh, he could mix and match uh, peas and get different colors and he kind of figured out that there was something going on within the genome of these uh, uh, peas, or there was something called a genome that was getting transferred from one generation to another. <clears throat> and then, of course, Watson and Crick identified DNA in the double helix in the 1950s. And then a, a, a seminal advance was Sanger and Gilbert being able to sequence DNA or being able to make artificial types of DNA. And then around 2000, <coughs> 2003, uh, we have a working draft of the entire first human genome published by two different groups, uh, Francis Collins at the NIH and Craig Bentner um, at his company. And here we are about 13 years later, 10 to 13 years later, and genetics and genome technology is being used in, in, a, in a routine uh, basis. So it's a very exciting time to be in medicine. Um, what's interesting, though, is DNA, for a lot of cases, and particularly 
um, large or, or complex diseases like obesity or cardiovascular disease, DNA is not completely deterministic. And what that means is that your DNA isn't necessarily, what you have in your genome isn't necessarily your destiny, as it's shown here in this article in Time magazine uh, that was published in the United States a year or two ago. Um, and it's also shown that you can modify you know, whatever genes you have by doing some environmental effect. And since we're interested in kind of food and metabolism, um, it has become clearer and clearer that um, you can modify how your genes are turned off or turned on by what you eat or how you exercise or if you smoke or if you, you know, drink, you drink alcohol. And um, so the good thing about it is you're not kind of, you're not wed uh, to your genetic code. It's really how your, your code is used uh, that is the most important thing. On slide seven, uh, just kind of reiterates, there's about a thousand hum human genetic trials published per month. And I list some of them here. Uh, <clears throat> the, one of them, the, in a particular from the Harvard School of Medicine that was used by the city of New York um, in 2012 to ban soft drinks because they found out that people uh, that drank a lot of sugar-sweetened beverages had a genetic risk in these, in these 32 different genes of being more obese the people that didn't have these mutations in their genes. And so Mayor Bloomberg at the time uh, thought that was a good I I a reason for banning large large soft drinks, although that was uh, eventually overturned. This just gives you an idea, this, uh, this slide, of how many papers are published in genetics alone. And we talked about big data earlier, but this really uh, gets to the heart of it when you look at genetics. There's so much information uh, being published on a monthly basis. And even in one of our tests uh, that, we, that, we, that we talk about later in, in, in the webinar, there was 35,000 reviewed clinical trial papers uh, that we went through in order to get the information um, that, was, that was used in our particular FIT test. <coughs> so, uh, on slide eight, so what is you, you know, human variation? What is genetics? What does that mean? You know, I, everybody knows you've got DNA. Um, and everybody also probably understands that, that DNA is uh, about 99% the same in, in, in individuals, whatever race you're in. We all have the same complement of about 25,000 genes. Uh, there's about 1 million to 4 million <clears throat> mutations in these genes, what we call variants. <clears throat> and these are really important because these give the differences. These are why you're, you're different than I am. You metabolize fats differently than I would. I metabolize sugars differently than, than you do. <clears throat> so those, those mistakes or those variations are what we measure as a genetic testing company and we're responsible for getting the correct information uh, to the doctor and, and eventually the user. So on slide nine I show um, uh, what, what I mean by variation in the genome and there's a number of different types of variations. Uh, variations can mean um, is single point mutations, uh, which are called SNPs, um, variations, uh, which I show in the first uh, uh, slide there, polymorphisms. Variations can mean deletions, bigger chunks of DNA are missing. Variations can mean insertions as well. You can have pieces of DNA that are moved from one place to another and inserted in the genome, and that changes how the genes work or how they're turned on and turned off, or even the, how, the, how the protein is made. Uh, from the individual genes. You could change how it's folded so it doesn't bind to its receptor um, as efficacious as when it's uh, a normal. So these 25,000 genes, or 20 to 25,000 genes that we all have, there's a lot of different types of mutations in each one of these uh, genes that's, that, that, that causes the variations. And so uh, for pathway genomics, we're really interested um, in how to interpret that information, what we call the last mile. So we don't look at genetics in a vacuum. We look at a lot of different types of data, whether it's the gen genetic data, or the metabolome, or the proteome, or even your blood pressure, or clinical data. We take all that into consideration when we design a report or design the test. And then we use genetics as just another tool in order to augment uh, the report that we give the physician. We also have the ability to take other types of information, whether it's uh, linked uh, uh, Fitbit information 
or <clears throat> uh, or uh, information around blood pressure, and we can use that as part of the uh, the report structure that we give uh, the clinician. So we have a, a, a very large in engineering group um, and scientific group. Um, and since we are a CLIA and, 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 and CAP certified laboratory, we have to have very precise reports. And the reports have to be based on, on published peer-reviewed data that, um, sh that is human clinical trial data. Mm -hmm. There's nothing in our reports except human clinical trial data. So on, on slide 11, I show some of the gene techniques, uh, detection techniques that we use at Pathway. We can measure individual uh, SNPs, which we use in microarrays. We also have uh, different types of, of microarray technology called fluidine, which we can measure bigger. I talked about the insertions and the lesions. We can measure that through fluidine. We can also do sequencing. We do whole genome and next generation sequencing. Some of our cancer projects uh, require that we sequence the entire gene. So we have a number of different types of machines from a number of different types of vendors. Uh, that we use uh, that goes into the back end of the reports. Uh, we could do epigenetics. Epigenetics is a kind of a hot topic uh, now in the genetics field. That is basically how your genes are turned on and off, and we can measure uh, epigenetic modifications uh, as well. On slide 12, um, I show you uh, what a typical flow in, in a report looks like, uh, the workflow. So it's a very complicated system. Up in the left-hand corner at uh, number one, we, we take your saliva or blood, or we can even do tissue, but primarily we do saliva and we isolate out the DNA. And then we enrich it or we make more copies of it and then we chop it up and we bind it uh, to certain known um, uh, pieces of DNA where we know the sequences, we know that there's a, a mutation in there. And then we, um, uh, we basically have a colored reaction um, that, we, that we measure the color. Um, and, and put it through in our informatics system, which again is very complicated. We take, we take uh, inform information from outside the company, whether it's the SNP database or the COSMIC database you know, for cancers or the Thousand Genome Project. We take all that information and measure your DNA against that normal kind of information. And that's what gives us really the report. And then we have an MD that looks at the report uh, MD has to order the report and MD also looks at the report before it goes out and the reports are generated in a fashion that is very uh, user-friendly and readable. Uh, we also have uh, you know, clinical geneticists on staff or nutritionists and dietitians that the patients um, have access to and also the MDs have access to if they don't really understand uh, the report. So we have it is a complete service. Um, so just to give you an idea, uh, slide number 13 uh, of the market opportunity, you know, there, you know, the genetic testing market is forecast to be about 25 billion worldwide in 2020. It's probably around 8 billion uh, at this point. But I think what's really most important that in the United States, only about three, today, 2014, only about three, two to three percent of the U.S. population has received a genetic test. But the popular beliefs uh, by physicians are that almost 80% of patients in the U.S. could benefit from some sort of genetic testing. And the consumers also believe that number. That number comes from consumers as well. About 80% believe that genetic testing will increase over the next five years and is helpful uh, to them as patients. So in the U.S., I think there's this ground swelling that doctors realize that genetics is kind of here to stay. Um, and we sell our reports in, in 50 different states. We have probably have 20,000 physicians ordering our reports. Um, and I don't, you know, the questions that we get now aren't necessarily around is the science validated in these reports. We get more questions around how do I use it or, you know, what type of patient I should be using the report for. And we have, um, in our, you know, our, our people that go out and our, and our business development people go and help physicians and, and hospitals understand that. So, um, some of the trends that, that, that we see, uh, at least in the United States, and it's, it's probably applicable uh, worldwide, is there are increasing health issues. The, the, the world is getting older, and so there's more obesity, there's, and there's more sequela, the disease sequela to obesity, whether it's type 2 diabetes, or joint replacements, 
or heart disease. Um, people are becoming more and more overweight, and there's a lot more chronic diseases. And so chronic diseases, as people get older, um, are, 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 are mushrooming in terms of um, the amount and numbers of people getting these diseases compared to infectious diseases. And so uh, in, and, and, and another trend that we see is the whole personalization of medicine. Medicine is becoming much more personalized. Um, as physicians, we always practice you know, personalized medicine, but now we have tools to do it. We can give you information around your genetics or your proteomics, um, and we can dial in certain things uh, you know, based on your genetics that are, that are potentially more efficacious for you as a patient rather than somebody else. And a good, good, good things around that are, are, are typically uh, 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 you know, things around diet. You know, we can dial in certain diets. We can look at and see whether you have a propensity to have a higher you know, lipid ratios or uh, lower glucose ratios. We can look at all those things in your genetics and give the doctor information around how he can pers help personalize uh, therapies. And then in the center, you know, genetics and epigenetics, the research capabilities are really mushrooming. And it's become kind of a, a, a crux and a core of how medicine is going to be practiced um, in the United States. Um, and well, what we're also finding out is that um, since we, we go into many doctor's offices and we talk to a lot of different patients, um, and I give a lot of talks, and we find out that genetics is a, is a very, very powerful tool for changing behavior. And to get people to change their behavior is a, is a very important thing get them to change their lifestyle is a very important thing in order to modify you know, healthy, healthy traits. Um, it's, everybody knows that you, you should eat more vegetables and you should you know, drink in moderation and all those good things that you learned in grade school, but people kind of don't take it to, the, the, to charge. They do take to charge or they do consider the information when it's backed up by scientific uh, validation and genetics. And genetics is con it's considered something that is my blueprint. It's something very personal to me. So uh, there's been many studies that have been done that have showed that in order to uh, <clears throat> uh, clinical trials around information, around food, around, you know, if, if my genes say that um, I should eat this, People tend to take that more to heart, and patients take that more to heart. And again, there's been, a, and I list some here on, on slide 16, there's been a number of large clinical trials that have shown this, that if you give information about it, uh, that you probably will respond better to a low-fat diet you know, than a low-carbohydrate diet, and, and that's uh, is shown in your genetics. You know, your, your certain genes you know, metabolize carbohydrates different than they do uh, lipids compared to somebody else. People take that information to heart and it's much easier to get them to change their behavior. And when you're dealing with people that are overweight or you're trying to manage glucose and di type 2 diabetes or cardi even cardiovascular disease, try to get their lipid profile down, um, if you give them information about themselves, they really tend to take that to heart. <clears throat> now, um, in the United States, um, as I mentioned earlier, since chronic diseases are becoming much more prevalent, um, in the U.S., healthcare costs are really driven by obesity. And uh, in fact, about 80, you know, 80 percent of all uh, healthcare claim costs are due to an individual's lifestyle. This was a study that was published, uh, a very, uh, very well-read study in 2009 by the Indiana State University. Um, and then 70 percent of all costs are combined to obesity and related conditions. And the conditions in the U.S. are cardiovascular disease, cancer, and diabetes. So. About 80% of cardiovascular disease is preventable, about 60% of cancer is preventable, and about 80% of diabetes is preventable, and it's all around obesity and diet, <clears throat> or, or diet uh, management. In fact, in the U.S., our healthcare budget is about $1.8 trillion a year, uh, and most of it, the vast majority of it, is uh, uh, costs are associated with chronic diseases. So much of this is preventable. So if we can get people to manage their diets, if we can get people to um, and, you know, drop a little weight, um, we can make a huge impact in, um, in, in, in the cost of medicine. And just to show you, um, you know, in slide uh, 18, I show that um, uh, the number of people with diabetes in, the, in, in worldwide is around 400 million um, in, at this point with type 2 diabetes, uh, which is all diet and, and obesity related, the vast majority of it. And it's not just in the United States, you know, even in Southeast, in Asia and Southeast Asia, 
and in India there are, n there are an enormous numbers of people that are type 2 diabetes and it's getting worse. Um, in the U.S., uh, by the year 2020, uh, our population will be about uh, 350 million, and uh, it's predicted there'll be almost 60 million type 2 diabetics in the U.S. There's about 60 million uh, pre-diabetics pre in the U.S., and so it's a booming and, and bad problem. Diabetes is a very, very expensive uh, medical condition to manage. Um, so now, so talking about personalization, <coughs> um, um, it, is, it is a well-known fact now that uh, weight management and genetics, uh, or genetics and, and obesity, uh, the causal factors of obesity are well known. It's, you know, overeating and, you know, bad eating patterns and lack of exercise, but there's also a very strong genetic component uh, to obesity. Probably 40 to 70 percent um, of genetic predisposition uh, or obesity predisposition is based on genetics. And these have been, uh, you know, verified studies over and over again. Obesity does tend to run in families, and uh, there's very, very strong correlations between, you know, uh, uh, about 100 different genes that are known to have some uh, cause of increasing uh, BMI. But there's also, um, uh, you know, very strong new information around how the, the way we manage obesity or the way obesity was understood um, uh, is changing and, and basically it's changing uh, as I show here in slide 20 uh, the old paradigm was basically energy in uh, you know versus energy out you either ate too much <clears throat> and uh, you didn't exercise enough and that's why uh, you were obese and that's not necessarily uh, the paradigm that people are, are, are talking about now what is in the new paradigm is that people are different you're different than I am you won't respond to a certain diet the same way I will. I won't respond to fats the same way you will. And now a lot of that has to do with genetics, which I've outlined in red here. And uh, these, this new paradigm was put out by the NIH and the Obesity Society last year. You know, and basically that, basically what it says is that, you know, genetics and lifestyle factors are extremely important in why people um, tend to be obese and, and uh, you know, compared to certain people, you know, compared to other people. And it's not just energy intake and um, energy expenditure, although those are very important. It's the type of food. It's what you're eating. It's the type of calories uh, that, that are becoming very, uh, very important in uh, understanding uh, some of the uh, causes of obesity. So. Uh, this field of nutrigenomics, uh, which has become kind of a buzzword around uh, uh, the medical profession, um, is really the science of studying how your diet and genes and lifestyle all interact. And as I mentioned uh, earlier, everybody's different. You know, I don't respond to fats the same way you would because I've got four million different types of mutations, you know, in my genes that regulate fats differently than you do. I won't respond to a certain diet, you know, compared uh, to somebody else. Um, it might be the perfect diet to put somebody on a low-fat diet, whereas it would not be the perfect diet for me. And it's also well known that you know genes, uh, and your genes also determine what types of food that you like. There's huge behavioral mechanisms around taste and what you like to eat, and how you perceive food. You know, do you get full? Um, and so your genes are actually regulating, you know, as well. Um, the types of foods that you know, that you like to eat, and so nutrigenomics is kind of trying to understand that what, what that means is trying to understand all those uh, interrelationships. And now some some data, you know, I think uh, from a macro perspective, um, if you look at, uh, we all know that we should eat more, you know, vegetables and not as much meat. And uh, just to give you uh, to reinforce that, um, uh, this was a study that was uh, done in uh, you know over eight years in 73,000 uh, Seventh-day Adventists in the U.S. Seventh-day Adventists are the are the one group in the United States that, that, that on average lives longer uh, than anybody else, and they have very strict uh, dietary uh, regimes that are part of their uh, philosophy, and uh, so they followed these 73,000 people over five over six over six years. And uh, they basically, you know, tiered them into six or seven different groups in terms of what types of vegetarians, you know, compared to people that just ate red meat. So this graph shows that the people that lived the longest or had the less, the least mortality over those uh, seven years, 19% were the vegetarians that also ate fish. 
So the, the, the hardcore vegans were a little bit less, and then it goes all the way down to the semi-vegetarians, uh, which eat uh, chicken but no red meat. The, if, you, if you were a meat eater or a majority of red meat, you would be at zero, zero percent. So this, this, uh, this chart shows decreasing mortality. So the bigger the bar means the less people die you know, over that particular time. And the ones that died, uh, uh, again, that, that had the best uh, 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 or the least mortality were the uh, vegetarians that ate, that ate fish. And this is a study that's been replicated before, but this just happens to be a, a pretty new one that was just published um, a couple months ago. So what does that mean? So it means a lot that <clears throat> we do understand from a macro perspective that eating more vegetables, eating fish, probably not eating as much red meat, probably not eating as much fatty food is probably better for you, but how is that? But, but the, the types of fats and the types of carbohydrates are very, very important to determine on a micro scale um, how that affects your phenotypes. Or, and the phenotype, in the, in the case uh, of our interest here, is obesity or even you know, the sequela of obesity management, whether it's cardiovascular disease or type 2 diabetes. And so nutrients are all active compounds. You know, nutrients you know, bind to certain. I'll show you this in, a, in an upcoming slide. Um, but they affect, it affects your DNA, it affects how your RNA is made, it affects your proteins, and then it affects your phenotype. So it's a very, very complicated, uh, but we're teasing out you know, the information around each one of these areas and showing how they all interact and they're all kind of choke points in determining what you, the phenotype or the phenotype meaning the result in the human, whether he's overweight or not overweight, has high blood pressure, has type 2 diabetes. Um, it's a very complicated system. And in the next slide, I show how the carbohydrates and fat, and even the fats and carbohydrates, they work together, and they're all regulated by, by genes. I show, I, sh I show some, if you remember your chemistry, some fatty acids on the top there in, in a carbohydrate molecule. Uh, but what's interesting is that insulin, you know, insulin, increased insulin resistance you know, means you need more insulin to handle the carbohydrates. But then the carbohydrates, more carbohydrates mean more fat storage, less fat breakdown, and there's, uh, uh, there's fat uh, you know, molecules in the wrong places, meaning in, in your cardiovascular system. So it's kind of an evil circle. So carbohydrates and fats are all regulated by genes, and a lot of times they're regulated by the same genes, but they just give you, uh, they give you different effects. So it's all kind of a, you, you, can't, you can't kind of separate out things um, uh, one from another without looking at the whole and what you're, what you're trying to affect. And that's kind of what we did with one of our, the next slide, with one of our genetic tests. Uh, we show that, um, uh, you know, that, that we screen a lot of different types of genes, almost a hundred of them, and they're genes that regulate a lot of different um, uh, phenotypes, whether it's uh, feeding behavior like satiety or insulin resistance or uh, endurance, you know, for VO2 max or some vitamin, the, re the receptors for some vitamins, there, there's all this very strong interplay between your brain and your gut and your pancreas and even your, the adipose tissue. And adipose tissue is not uh, uh, an innate uh, tissue, it's a tissue that secretes things. Your brain secretes things, your gut secretes things, and all these proteins, things like glucagon and insulin and GLP-1, they all have receptors that they bind to and all the receptors have genes that either make, make receptors that bind things correctly or they don't make receptors that bind things, uh, or they don't make the, the, the ligand bind correctly. And they turn on effects and turn off effects. So it's a very, very complicated system. And the system architecture is, is important to understand. And that's what we're giving in, our, in, in, in this genetic test. We're giving you information around this big system. In slide 26, like I said, micronutrients are very active compounds. You know, these are compounds that bind things. Vitamin A binds to its uh, a receptor uh, that's in the cell nucleus. Vitamin D, you know, binds to the VDR receptor. Uh, fatty acids, you know, bind to PPRA gamma. They bind to things. These micronutrients bind to things, and they turn things on, and they turn genes on. They turn genes off. Um, they regulate certain things. So even small amounts of, of stuff that you put in your body. Um, has strong regulatory effects. Fatty acids, it's very, very well known in fatty acids. And the types, and so the types of fatty acids are very important to understand. Omega fatty acids are, in general, good for individuals. 
that have certain uh, G, uh, receptors that bind omegas correctly. You might need more than somebody else, but they're certainly better than some of the, the, the saturated fatty acids and, you know, that, 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 that do certain things. So my point in this slide is, is that micronutrients, vitamins, fatty acids, steroids, you know, carbohydrates, drugs, they all are active compounds. They all bind something that turns genes on and off. And in the next slide, I kind of really uh, show this, even, even for new, kind of exotic nutrients, you know, resveratrol binds to the CERT and, and, PPR, and regulates the PPRA gamma receptors. Um, you know, ginseng uh, 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 binds to steroid receptors and estrogen receptors. We've known this. Alpha lipoic acid turns on AMPK is an AMPK inhibitor. So all of these things, you know, these vitamins, these uh, micronutrients, uh, uh, you know, even licorice, uh, they all have uh, things, or they all have receptors, they all have places that they bind to and turn genes on and off and have effects in the body. So when you've got a four million different mutations in all these uh, types of receptors, you're bound to have certain effects different than somebody else. And that's what we're trying to show and tease out with genetics. And in fact, you know, for exercise metabolism, carbohydrates, glycogen, and fats work in tandem and bind to a lot of the different uh, or a lot of the similar types of pathways and pathway receptors uh, when you're when you're running really hard or you're running a long distance you tend to use more glycogen um, which binds to certain uh, 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 turns things on and off like the AMK pathways but also fatty acids do that as well free fatty acids turn on the PPRA gamma so they work kind of in tandem so here I'm showing you in this complicated slide that fats and and, and carbohydrates work work together on a lot of the same pathways, maybe a little bit differently. You know, maybe they turn things one turns things on and another turns things off. But we're starting to understand how how metabolism is really regulated um, by foods and, and and nutrition. So now we take a little break. So uh, <clears throat> this slide is kind of a, an overall slide that was uh, I, I I took this from Stanford Medical School. Um, there was a lecture I gave up there, and um, and really is kind of an overview of how food uh, regulates a diet response. And so your food intake um, by epigenetics and also genetics uh, interacts with your base metabolism, your DNA, your types of genes, your mutations, and it turns these genes on. You get what's called expression, you know, gene expression. Um, and that's really food specific biology and then the gene expression you know makes proteins uh, and these proteins have metabolites and these metabolites are what we call the diet response and that's a feedback mechanism so you're you, when you eat you, you either you, sometimes you can feel full or you, by eating certain things other times you don't feel as full that's uh, you know a diet response mechanism so food intake and processing and how we process the food um, it's important. It's also it's a very uh, multifactorial uh, uh, problem or, or issue, uh, but also tends to um, show how um, the diet re is responsive, you know, to the food intake in terms of what genes are turned on and off, and how your genes also provide feedback in terms of what types of food you like to eat. Um, and so that's very important, um, as you show on the next slide, and the implications are very important. So that means your genotype can affect your diet, and which means your diet and your genotype are very, work in tandem to provide a health outcome. Do you have an increased BMI? Is your sugar up? You know, do you respond to fats differently than somebody else? Those are all health outcomes. And the biggest thing that we do on a daily basis, obviously, how we, how we interact with our environment is around our diet and, and what we eat. And it's a very exciting time to try and understand how your diet regulates your genotypes and then, and then comes up with a health outcome. And I'm going to show this, you know, going forward um, in the next series of slides, you know, how we use that information around genetic information around uh, the determinants of ingestive behavior. Uh, there's kind of three or four kind of big areas in ingestive behavior, uh, which means, you know, food intake. And, uh, behaviors that cause me to eat. There's sensory perception, there's energy homeostasis, what I do without, without really doing anything, and then there's reward circuitry. There's, you know, does it, do I like pizza? You know, do I uh, like to eat bananas? 
uh, so there's uh, there, there's kind of uh, all these are regulated all these uh, uh, behavior areas are regulated by genes and again since you have mutations in these genes people don't respond uh, the same way um, uh, to certain things you know versus others and what I'm going to focus in on here on the next slide slide number 32 is the glucose transporter glucose transporter is a is a is a tube basically that's in every cell that pushes glucose from one from from your blood in into the into into the certain cell types and it's called the GLUT2 protein and this protein GLUT2 has a number of different types of mutations in it so the gene that makes this GLUT2 protein um, there's a number of mutations in it and you don't uh, people that have one type of mutation don't move sugar uh, from your bloodstream into into the cells, um, uh, as well as somebody else that has another type of mutation that probably moves it in too fast. And these GLUT2 receptors are in every cell uh, in your body, in your brain cells, in your kidney cells, in your liver cells, pancreas cells. Every cell in your body has GLUT2 receptors because uh, we need sugar. Every cell needs sugar. And so this particular study, which was done a couple years ago, in two different populations, it was a replicated study of a thousand people, about a thousand people in each one showed that there's a, there's a variant in this GLUT2 transporter type um, that is shown to be, uh, uh, that the people that have this variant have a higher sugar intake. I mean, they eat more sugar, uh, they need more sugar than people that don't have this variant. Now this was a very important study because now we're getting down to the kind of nitty gritty of how glucose you know, by itself is metabolized, how it's really transported. From one, uh, uh, you know, from one cell to another, and in, in these two population studies, you know, it showed very clearly um, that uh, the the glucose uh, uh, two re uh, receptor, uh, if you had, you know, uh, uh, one variant versus another, uh, in slide number thirty four, uh, the the THR slash uh, uh, leucine variant, you had uh, about twenty grams. Um, increase in glucose, uh, uh, yeah, taking in more glucose than somebody that didn't have this variant. Uh, this variant. And this was again replicated in, in two different populations. And the p-values were very strong. So now we know, you know, we know that <clears throat> if you've got this GLUT2 variant, you're going to you're going to you're going to eat more sugar. It's going to change the energy homeostasis around carbohydrates. And it's probably going to cause you to increase uh, the amount of calories that you take just for around this one receptor. You're going to eat more sugar than somebody else or, or the, the, that doesn't have this, uh, this receptor. And you have to learn, uh, understand that there's uh, hundreds of different types of receptors that, bond, that, that, that regulate uh, glucose and glucose homeostasis and also fat homeostasis. But we just looked at one here, one particular receptor here and got a dramatic effect. In, 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 in BMI and then you couple that with behavioral traits in the next slide I show uh, the dopamine receptor and dopamine is a very classic uh, a gene uh, and, and protein uh, that are in your good reward circuits you feel good uh, when you've got a lot of dopamine floating around you know sugar is very addictive sugar is, is more addictive um, there's been shown sugar is more addictive than some drugs like cocaine and the reason is is it makes you feel good um, and so if you've got receptors um, that, that for the dopamine receptor, DRD2, um, that um, uh, uh, in particularly one, this one mutant, you're going to again increase, you're going to again increase your sugar intake compared to somebody that doesn't have that receptor. And then you couple that with, with the, with the GLUT2 receptor and now you're getting a lot of different, or a, 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 an increased response um, around uh, food intake. And, and particularly sugar intake that you wouldn't that you wouldn't see in somebody that doesn't have those those particular uh, gene variants. Um, and this also goes along for you know uh, this whole idea around g gene and diet interaction. And another particularly interesting uh, sugar regulator and fat regulator uh, gene is TCF7L2, and this is a classic gene that's been linked to type 2 diabetes. And uh, particularly, it's also been uh, linked to now the Mediterranean diet with this particularly very interesting study by Ornavas in 2014. He showed that if you had certain variants in this TCF7L2 um, uh, gene, in particular the TT variant, you tended to have a higher stroke risk uh, on, a, on a low, because you had a lower 
a lower level of Mediterranean diet, meaning there wasn't as many omega fatty, fatty acids in it, there wasn't as much uh, olive oil compared to somebody that had uh, that didn't have that variant, you would have a lower stroke risk. So uh, one single variant in one gene increased, actually increased blood pressure and all based around uh, Mediterranean diet and, um, and, and, and omegas and, and also sugar uh, intake. Um, so this was a very good study done in, in I think a couple thousand people. Um, again, it goes back to that if you've got a number of these different variants, they all kind of add up and they show that you, know, you add it to the GLUT variant and you add it to the DRD2 variant, you get a very dramatic change in the types of uh, information that, that, that people, or the types of foods, food is information, the types of information that people are eating and how that is being processed. And so uh, what I'm getting at here is all these genes interact with each other. So the IGF gene interacts with the PPAR gamma gene, interacts with the FTO gene. If you've got variants in FTO, you, tend, you probably should be on a low fat diet compared to somebody else that doesn't have these variants because they're in these pathways that are, that are almost choke points you know, for how you metabolize certain things. And that's what we look at. We look at pathways. We look at how genes interact uh, with each other and then, and then develop our own algorithms and show and, and use those algorithms in the report and give that information. So you sh if you've got these you know, six or seven different genes or these variants in these genes, you probably should decrease the amount of fat or even increase the amount of carbohydrate that's in your diet. Um, so genetics is the core. Genetics is the blueprint that everybody has. Again, we have, all of us have these 25,000 different genes and a lot of them, thousands of them, regulate diets and what you eat. It's just common sense. Uh, now we're able to kind of tease out the individual differences and put it into reports, uh, you know, for clinicians. Put them into these uh, genetic tests. Um, uh, they're getting a lot of uh, uptake, and there's been a lot of clinical trials that have been done on them uh, to show that they're they're really valid. And so one of these uh, the reports um, that the, the, the we uh, that we publish is called the Pathway Fit Test. Are also the pathway uh, healthy weight test, and we we look at about a hundred different genes in this complicated brain, gut, taste, um, metabolism pathways, and provide a report for the physician to use on what potential diets um, are better for me compared to something else. So we look at weight management. Uh, we can maximize energy. Uh, we get better treatment options, and we. And the big thing is, is we can help you with your patients to change their behavior. We give you information around how you metabolize sugars, fats, and carbohydrates. We give you information around what exercise is probably going to be more beneficial for uh, somebody versus something else. And you, we use it. You use it as a, it's a very patient-friendly, you know, uh, uh, a very uh, easy-to-read, you know, type of test. And we basically tell you what you you do. These are ve this is very actionable information. And uh, uh, we, it's a unique combination of uh, nutrigenomic and medication and general health uh, information. We look at the type two diabetes genes, um, and we look and, and 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 people use it. You know, uh, use this uh, pathway fit or healthy weight test uh, for a number of different uh, uh, you know clinical problems. Um, we also have a, a diet plan that goes along with the test. So if we tell you what diet you should be on, whether you should be on a low-fat diet based on your genetics or a low-carb diet, we give you a diet plan that goes along with it. Whether it's 1,200 calories or 2,000 calories or 3,000 calories, we'll work with you uh, to provide the, the, you know, the, the best type of diet plan. And these, this is, we basically tell you, uh, you know, what you should be eating you know, on an individual, you know, uh, meal breakdown. You know, we, we look at breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And again, based on your genetics and some clinical data, um, we put together these, uh, uh, you know, very extensive diet plans. So the patient knows exactly what, and the doctor knows exactly what they should be eating uh, to get 20% lean protein or, you know, 35% healthy fats or, you know, 40% carbohydrates if that's the way it's supposed to be. Uh, so the four, and, you know, back one side. So the four different diets that we that we show in our in our pathway fit test, uh, we we both, we we will put you in either Mediterranean, low fat, low carb balance, and then if we, for Southeast Asia, we have an Asian diet um, that we also uh, will 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 use in the diet plans. Um, 
that's only applicable to uh, people of Asian uh, uh, ancestry. So on slide 44, uh, this test was, uh, again, uh, we looked at 35,000 peer-reviewed human scientific publications for the FIT test. Uh, then we had an outside board from the Pennington Biomedical Research Institute, from Stanford School of Medicine, from University of California, Berkeley, and Scripps. And uh, we had them look at the test to make sure that we weren't reporting on anything that we couldn't scientifically validate. We're very, very concerned with evidence-based medicine. That's all we want uh, to report on. And since we have clinicians ordering the test, this is not a direct-to-consumer test, it's a clinician ordered test, we have to be very careful about what we report on. So number 40, uh, slide number 45 just shows some of the major clinical trials um, that, that the information we used to put in this genetic test, whether it was the Pounds Loss trial in 2012, that was 50,000 people, to, this, to the Arachidonis study in 2008, that was even 500 people, we used many, many different clinical uh, bits of clinical trial information to get the phenotypic and genotypic information and put them put that into the test. So every one of the phenotypes that we report that we report on is very uh, uh, well characterized, and so you're basically getting a miniature report, um, a miniature clinical trial that was done on every single phenotype. You know, the hundred or so, uh, or excuse me, the 35 or so different phenotypes that we report on in the test has hundreds of clinical trials that have gone into the information backing it up. In fact, uh, in the US, the, the test is considered so well validated that we have uh, been approved in New York State uh, for the Pathway Fit Test, which was, which was a two-year process, and very difficult to do, uh, almost, um, almost, but not quite uh, like getting FDA approval. Um, and then every one of the large insurance companies in the United States will, will pay for it, including Medicare, uh, has now determined that they will pay for the pathway fit test and healthy weight test. Uh, since it's doctor's ordered, and the genes that we report on, uh, again, are very well characterized, and uh, there's been multiple, multiple clinical trials. In fact, to show you this, um, uh, just one of the gene, uh, genes that we report on, or the two genes that we report on, very classic genes, in the FIT test, the FTO locus and MCR4 locus, if you've got variants in new, these two different genes, that's the right-hand column, you'll probably end up being about 10 pounds or 4.5 kilograms you know, overweight compared to somebody that doesn't have those variants. This has been shown over and over and over again. Um, and those genes, MCR4, this melanocortin receptor, and the FTO receptors, both have to do a lot with uh, behavioral issues around fullness. You know, do I feel full? Um, and, 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 and we use that information uh, because FTO is also in the fat regulatory pathway. We use that information that if you have variants in FTO, we probably will put you on a lower, carbo a lower fat diet than somebody that doesn't have those variants. Um, and some of the other clinical trial information uh, that we use, uh, this was a study that was done at Harvard, <coughs> slide number 48, on this FTO gene that I just mentioned, the pound loss trial, which I referred to in an earlier slide, uh, they basically tell you that, you know, out of these 1,000 people that were on this trial, the people that had uh, FTO and were put in a low, uh, a higher protein or lower fat diet did much better in terms of weight loss. Almost 33%, uh, you know, more weight uh, that was lost uh, in this clinical trial. And that was also a replicated study that was done at Stanford uh, University um, around FTO and a couple more different genes that people had, uh, the people that did have these uh, these individual uh, gene variants uh, lost, uh, you know, much more weight and lost inches and lost pounds over people that didn't didn't have uh, those variants. <clears throat> Almost twice the number of, of, of waist inches, uh, with a p value that was very significant. And then we've done our own uh, clinical trials here at the VA Center in, in San Diego. Um, we also found about a 30% uh, weight loss increase in people that had uh, certain genomics. Uh, when we put them on the individual diets, uh, genome-based diets, versus a, a, a group of people that did not have uh, the genomic uh, information and did not have the genomics diet. So the four diets that we report on, we base that on your genetics, on the genomics. We got a lot more weight loss than people that were just put on standard care. Even though that they got a, a genetic test, they weren't put on the diets. Uh, that were um, that were recommended by by the genetic test, and then we reported. Uh, slide number fifty one shows that we reported uh, on the VA Medical Center results in an abstract. Uh, some of the genes uh, we found that the ANC 
ANKKI gene, uh, which is in the DRD2 pathway, that if you've got uh, you know variants in this uh, in this gene, you have a significant decrease in hemoglobin A1C from 67% down to 16%. Um, just on that one particular gene by itself. So this shows you that a lot of the different genes that we report on uh, have use uh, not only for weight management, but also for glucose control, uh, triglyceride control, and just a single variant in, this, in, in a particular gene can, ma can make a radical difference um, in the phenotype for the, for the user. Uh, we also report in, in the FIT test on a, on a number of uh, exercise and sports genes uh, genes uh, that have to do with VO2 max, uh, endurance training, power training. Um, slide 53, uh, you know, shows some of the uh, some of the genes that we report on, and these have all gone through clinical trials as well. Um, the PPRA gamma is a lipid regulator and has a lot to do with, uh, you know, there's there's individuals that have certain genes uh, that probably will respond better to enter to endurance based uh, exercise than somebody that doesn't have those uh, particular variants. And also for power, there are genes around power. Uh, Actin-3 is a very well-known uh, uh, gene marker for, for power. And uh, for sprinters, it's called the sprinter gene. Um, and uh, we use this information to kind of, to, for, for performance, people that are interested in performance, not necessarily to lose weight, but performance. You know, the, we had the, uh, the U.S. Olympic sac uh, cycling team take this pathway fit test and, and show that they got better performance when they uh, modified their exercise regimes a, a little bit. And so we, uh, we also have a section in the test uh, that looks at exercise. So slide 54, uh, so the uses of our, of our pathway fit and healthy weight tests um, are across the board. We have groups uh, that use it for weight management, uh, clinical groups large clinical weight management groups. We have nutrition maintenance performance. I mentioned the United States Olympic team. We did an exome study, uh, you know, for, for Pepsi-Cola that we, we, we genotyped a thousand of their marathon runners um, on the pathway fit test. And then people use it, uh, obviously, for behavior modification. Uh, Post-pregnancy weight loss is a big problem. We have OBGYNs ordering the test, cardiovascular disease. Uh, you know, 80% of cardiovascular disease is probably diet-related. Uh, diet and exercise related, corporate wellness and, uh, you know, groups order the test, metabolic, people that have metabolic syndrome, whether it's, uh, you know, uh, hypertriglycidemia or blood pressure increase or sugar increase, uh, we, have, we have people ordering the test just to use it for control of that. And, and as I mentioned earlier, in the U.S., we probably have around 20,000 physicians uh, that order the test on a regular basis in a lot of different types of groups. Um, we, we, we get orders from 44 different countries, and we translate the report into seven different languages, in, in the Spanish and Portuguese, uh, among others. Um, and uh, in the U.S., there's about uh, you know, 800,000, 800,000, 900,000 know, total authorized providers in the U.S., and we get uh, people from every different type of group you know, ordering uh, this pathway fit and, and, and healthy weight uh, genetic test. Um, uh, in fact, you know, we have uh, a lot of large companies that uh, we've done deals with um, that order block, uh, you know, amounts of, uh, of our tests, you know, whether it's the U.S. Olympic team or Equinox Health, uh, which is a major health chain um, in the U.S., uh, Scripps Clinic here in, in San Diego, IHH and Parkway Labs in Singapore, a lot of different types of corporate alliances uh, that, that are interested in either for their own um, you know, patient population or for their own uh, you know, particular uh, employees, um, getting them to maximize their, their health and wellness. And in fact, uh, there's a very popular television show uh, in the United States um, called The Biggest Loser. The Biggest Loser, uh, you might not be familiar with it, but it's uh, in the U.S. It's a it's a uh, television show that's been around for about 10 years, and um, the idea is that um, you need to lose as much weight as possible in uh, six weeks. Um, and they get people on the show that, are, that have huge BMIs. You know, some of them have BMIs of 60, 70, you know, BMI, and then they try to lose as much weight in, in six weeks. Um, and so these people are put on terrible diets and uh, you know, just rocks and water and exercise to death. And uh, you know, hopefully, the person that, that orders the, the, the loses the most weight, you know, is the winner. Um, and so they came to us, and uh, they had us genotype 
uh, 300 people on this on this Biggest Loser show with our Pathway Fit test. And uh, on the Pathway Fit test, uh, we got some. So we genotyped these uh, these very very strong, very high BMI individuals and compared them to 300 controls uh, which had normal BMIs and just looked at the difference in genes. Just looked at the straight differences. We weren't trying to manipulate their diets. We were we just want to look at genes that they had that were different. Uh, than people in the normal population. And it was a mixed population group. It was Caucasians and Asians and uh, uh, Hispanics, blacks in, in, this, in this 300. So it was a pool population group. And we found some very interesting things. We found that the classic obesity genes like FTO and MCR4 got a much higher increase um, in these people with very large BMIs um, than people than the general population for FTO it was 33 percent compared to 16 percent you know for MCR4 it was 22 percent compared to 3 percent so large increases um, in those classic obesity genes or obesogenic genes I should say obesogenic means if you're put in an environment where you're eating the wrong things and, and not exercising enough you probably will be more of a weight than somebody that doesn't have these genes or variants and then DRD2, which I mentioned earlier in the, the slide about gluten, DRD2, uh, which was a sugar, kind of a sugar regulating, you know, behavioral uh, issue. They had a lot more of that particular gene. Um, the biggest loser group did 56% versus 17% of the general population. And then uh, some other um, uh, uh, genes they had a lot more of. So the moral of the story is, is that there's definitely genetics that, that, and regulation genetics um, that um, are very important, you know, to try and understand uh, why people, you know, are overweight compared to the normal population. And in fact, it's become such a, uh, you know, a very hot topic that um, uh, many groups now, uh, whether it's, you know, Hugo or Stanford or, or, or Microgenet uh, in the UK um, are all looking at how genes and food regulates, even Nestle, some of these large companies. Uh, Nestle, Danone, uh, they've all got groups uh, looking at nutrigenomics and how to stratify their patients, you know, based on the genes and how to put out products or functional foods uh, that are that are that are tailored to you uh, more than something else. And, and my final slide, um, I show here that even the NIH in the United States and a large payer, Aetna, uh, which is one of the largest payers in the insurance companies in the U.S., is now uh, doing uh, genetic stratification tests around obesity, appetite, and behavior uh, around saliva-based uh, DNA tests and, and trying to stratify patient populations to figure out which people are going to respond best you know, to certain treatments uh, versus others. And uh, there's a growing enthusiasm and validation for the notion that new omics tools and methods will offer new insights into human nutrition research. And so the NIH has actually even put a fund together in order to, to fund some of these uh, projects. And um, uh, the whole uh, area of nutrigenomics and how our genes and diet interact. That's one thing you get out of this talk is that your genes and diet do interact and uh, your diet <coughs> uh, uh, and your, your, your diet you know, determines how your genes are turned on and turned off. And I think uh, that's the end of the, this webinar. And um, uh, my name is Michael Nova. I'm the Chief Medical Officer for Pathway Genomics. And I'd be happy to answer uh, any questions. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.